So yes, I'm going to take the next like 15 minutes or so to give um, a bit of an overview of graduate programs in statistics and biostatistics and talk a little bit about the application process. So before I get too far into that, I want to give you all a little bit of context of my own background and sort of trajectory to graduate school, where I went to graduate school, um, and that will sort of frame some of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So I did my undergraduate degree at St. Olaf College, which is a small liberal arts college in Minnesota. Um, and at St. Olaf, I was a math major, at, at least at the start. Um, so when I entered graduate school, I actually had no intention of ever even taking a statistics course and happened to take one by accident, ended up really loving it. And that changed my mind about what I wanted to do with my life. I had been sort of leaning towards sort of a pure math um, or math education track up until that point. Um, so I was sort of on the fence heading into my junior year trying to decide, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, and I applied for some summer research programs, ended up doing research in statistical genetics at a REU, a research experience for undergrads one summer. Um, and that I really convinced me that I did like doing research in statistics um, and was interested in those sort of bio statistics type applications. Um, so then my senior year, I continued doing research, um, a different program this time at St. Olaf during my senior year, and also along the way, I got some teaching experience. So sort of heading into my senior year, thinking about applying to graduate school, you know, I knew I was interested in statistics and wanted to learn more. I knew I liked research, and I knew I was interested in teaching. And so I kind of had this goal, you know, and or this thought at least in mind that I was interested in becoming a professor. And so knowing, you know, that you need a PhD to become a professor, that really framed the types of programs that I applied to. So I actually ended up applying to a mix of statistics and biostatistics programs and ultimately ended up at the University of Washington in their biostat department. Um, so at UW, I continued doing research in statistical genetics, which I had started as an undergrad and really just continued to fall in love with that area. So I ended up doing my dissertation in that area, picked up some more teaching experience along the way, working with both graduate students and undergraduate students. And that really helped cement for me that I did want to be a professor and particularly was interested in working with undergraduate students. So once I finished my PhD, was, which was pretty recent, just a little over a year ago, um, I came to McAllister. So another small school in Minnesota. Um, and I've been teaching at McAllister now for a little over a year in the math, stats, and computer science department. So it's been, what, I guess seven years since I applied to graduate school, um, but only about a year since I've been in grad school. And I've, you know, working with students now too at McAllister who are applying to grad school. So um, I've sort of continued to track, right, how the application process has changed over the years. So before I talk sort of details on applications, I want to just give sort of a brief overview of the types of programs that are out there um, and sort of thought things to be thinking about as you're trying to decide where to apply and to start even whether you want to apply to graduate school. So I think these three questions are sort of the main things that I was thinking about and sort of encourage students to think about as they're trying to decide whether to apply to graduate school. You know, I think the first thing is you want to make sure um, that you're interested in learning more about biostatistics or statistics or data science. Um, you want to sort of ask yourself if you enjoy doing research or independent projects. That's a big part of graduate school. And then be thinking about what type of job you want at the end of this all. So, I mean, you don't have to go into graduate school knowing exactly what you want to do, but having that idea, you know, can shape, you know, certain types of programs might set you up better for certain types of jobs. So at least having thought about that a little bit about what you want to end up doing is really useful to be thinking about as you're deciding where to apply. So a couple of quick disclaimers. I mean, I think for the most part, everybody who, who's here is um, attended a graduate panel because they're thinking about graduate school, right? But but I just want to say, right, that grad school is not for everyone. Not everyone has to go to graduate school. There are a lot of great jobs you can get with an undergraduate degree in statistics or math or data science. Um, it's a pretty big commitment, right, going to graduate school. So you really want to make sure that you're, you want to go if you're going to apply. 
Um, and thinking about the timing too, right? The best time to go to grad school is not the same for everybody. So I went to grad school right out of my finishing my undergrad degree, um, but I had a lot of classmates who worked a job for a couple of years and then went to grad school or got a master's degree first and in a different field and then changed their mind about what they wanted to, to study. So timing, you know, you don't have to go right after right after college. You can take some time to think about it if you if you feel like you need that time. So thinking about where to apply, um, once you've convinced yourself that you do in fact want to apply, there are in my mind kind of three main types of degree programs. So there are PhD programs and master's programs. And then there's a distinction within master's programs in terms of whether they're more research oriented and you know involve like a thesis, sort of a mini dissertation, um, or if they're more coursework oriented and maybe involve a capstone project, but not quite as much research. So there are differences in all of these in terms of length for PhD is going to be the longest type of training and what types of jobs they're setting you up for. So capstone or coursework oriented masters are I think a little bit more oriented towards setting you up for a job in industry, um, whereas PhD and thesis masters programs are more oriented towards setting you up for a job in sort of a research oriented position or academia um, or certainly industry jobs as well. But um, there are some differences there in terms of type of training and, and jobs that they're setting you up for. And then there's a pretty big difference in cost. So if you don't know this already, a really important thing to know about grad school in statistics and biostatistics is that pretty much all PhD programs are paid for. So when you get accepted to a PhD program that comes with a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship offer as well that pays for your tuition and a stipend. So a monthly stipend that pays for your living costs. So you, you know, for the most part are not going to be paying to go to school if you're getting a PhD. That sort of funding is a lot harder to come by for master's programs. So, um, you know, there are ways to get master's programs paid for at least partially, but expect to be paying more out of pocket if you're, um, going to a master's program. They're shorter, right? They don't last as long, but but tend to cost a little bit more. So another big distinction, right, to things to be thinking about is which sort of subfield do I want to be in? So we've got statistics programs, biostatistics programs, data science programs. Maybe some of you are thinking about math or epidemiology or public health or other sort of quantitative things that are related. And there's differences here too, right, in terms of, again, length, type of funding, uh, or type of training, funding can be different, and the types of jobs that these programs set you up for. So um, to be honest, I know the most about statistics and biostatistics programs. That's kind of what was on my radar when I was applying. Data science was still very new seven years ago when I was looking at graduate programs. So a lot more data science programs exist now than used to even just a few years ago. And there can be quite a bit of variety in data science programs, depending on what type of school they're housed within, right? So there's data science programs like in business schools that are going to be more business analytics focused. And that's going to be very different than a data science program housed within a stat department or a computer science department. So paying attention to sort of where that program lives within the university that it's at is important to think about um, and what types of you know, industry connections that program is going to have um, and sort of what the application area focus is going to be. So thinking about the distinction between statistics and biostatistics, um, you know, there's sort of a reputation that statistics programs tend to be a little bit more theoretical, a bit more mathy, and biostatistics programs a bit more applied. Um, with that said, I think that there are some exceptions to that rule or less differences between some programs than um, people realize. So for example, at the University of Washington, the statistics department and the biostatistics department, the students in the PhD programs there take pretty much all the same courses the first two years. So there's, you know, very, sim uh, very much similar training that you're getting in your core coursework. And what tends to be different mostly is the application area of the types of data that you're working with. And maybe sort of more dissertations in the biostat program are focused on you know, developing methods and, and analyzing data, whereas, you know, maybe a little bit more common to have sort of more theoretical dissertation topics and statistics, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, and I think because of that too, in terms of getting a job at the end of the day, I think 
um, a lot of times, again, there's this perception that if I get my degree in biostatistics, I have to stay in bio-related application areas for the rest of my career. And from my perspective, that is absolutely not true. So I think um, you know, a lot of companies, and UW is in the Seattle area, so that's where, where I know the most about, a lot of tech companies in the Seattle area were really excited about hiring biostat students um, because they had a lot of experience working with data. And so they didn't care, you know, that the focus had been on sort of bio related data. What was most important, right, is that you still have this skill set that's really useful, sort of no matter the application area. So, you know, maybe historically biostat graduates tended to work more like for pharmaceutical companies and um, bio related things, but I think that might be changing from my perspective, at least more recently. So of course, if you're thinking about grad school, there's lots of other things to be thinking about too, besides um, as you're sort of evaluating which program you want to apply to, you know, what types of research opportunities are available, how big the program is, the demographics of the students that go to that program, reputation, admission requirements, location, right? This is somewhere you have to go live for many years. Um, so all of these things are important to be thinking about as well. All right, so that's a little bit of an overview. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the application process. So in a sort of typical grad school application, these are the main components that go into your application. So to start, you know, most schools are going to have a, some sort of online application form. And this is mostly going to be basic sort of about you questions. So like, what's your name? Where did you go to school? That sort of thing. Um, some of them might have short essay questions that really varies by school. It's kind of hard to predict. Um, and then another thing related to the online application and just applications in general that I wanted to mention is that most schools have an application fee and sometimes that fee is not super small. So just something to be aware of as you're applying to school, right, to keep track of those application fees that it can get kind of expensive to apply to graduate school. Um, I have noticed that some schools seem to be waiving some of those fees this year, um, and most schools usually have some sort of waiver process if you don't have the financial resources to pay for their application fee, but just something that sort of you need to keep an eye out for. Um, another sort of bigger part of your application packet will be your transcript. So as you're sort of the admissions committee is looking over your transcript, they're gonna look at your overall GPA. Um, but perhaps most importantly, I think they're really gonna be focused on your grades and sort of the relevant courses, right? So they care a lot more about how you've done in your math and stats courses than about how you've done in um, you know, your art classes. And besides you know, what grades you got, they're also of course gonna be checking for which classes you've taken, right? Have you actually taken the required classes that are listed you know, on our website as required to enter this program? Um, and just sort of generally how many and how rigorous of stat and math classes have you taken? So they're gonna be looking at what you've taken besides just how well you've done in those classes. Another thing that you'll submit um, at least historically with a grad school application is your GRE scores. So um, I will say sort of caveat just before I say much more about this is that many schools are waiving the GRE requirement this year. Um, and I've actually noticed a trend over the last couple of years too that that some programs are moving away towards requiring the GRE in all. Um, but you, so it might depend on the program where you're applying whether or not they ask you to submit GRE scores. And I would say for the most part, programs are gonna ask if they do ask for a score, they're gonna ask for a score on sort of the general GRE. Most programs do not require you or even request that you take the math subject test, but there are some programs that will ask for that. Um, so that again, is gonna vary by the school. Mostly what they're looking for if you um, do submit GRE scores is how you did on the quantitative portion um, and sort of again, a little less focused on the verbal and writing component of your GRE score. Um, for international students, something to watch out for is um, a lot of schools will require that you submit TOEFL scores. There's some variability here in terms of um, whether they're required in the first place. Like for example, some schools won't require you to submit these scores if you are an international student studying at a college in the United States, but some will still require that. And some schools have sort of minimum scores that you need to get on TOEFL. So um, 
but that varies a lot by program, so it's kind of hard to, to provide any general statements about what they're looking for there. Um, a sort of bigger piece of the puzzle is going to be your CV or resume. What they're looking for, you know, in sort of assessing your, your CV, the things that you should have listed on there are sort of research or work experience or any internships that you've done, particularly relevant to the program you're applying to, any teaching experience, or have you done any tutoring or grading or that sort of thing? Um, what sort of programming languages are you familiar with? And then, you know, things that you might optionally include, right? Sometimes it can be helpful to sort of lay out your relevant coursework, right? They're getting their your transcript, but they might not be familiar with the numbering system at your university, right? So like if Calc 3 is required, Calc 3 has a different number at every different school. So sometimes it can help the admissions committee out if you clearly specify, right, that yes, I have taken Calc 3 and it's called this on my transcript. Um, otherwise, like listing things like your extracurriculars, volunteering, I think was a little, they'll look at it, but I think not super important. I think these other pieces are more important. Um, and sort of as you're framing your resume, the way I think about this, especially for students applying to PhD programs, right, as I sort of mentioned, right, when you get into a PhD program, it also comes with this offer to be a research assistant or a teaching assistant. So when schools admit you to their program, they're also hiring you as an employee, right? So they want to make sure that not only are you going to be able to pass their classes, but are you going to be able to work as a research assistant or a teaching assistant? So that experience is what they're looking for on your CV or resume. So the piece that you'll probably spend the most time working on is your statement of purpose, or sometimes called a personal statement. Different schools have different names for it. Some ask you for more than one statement. Um, the main things that I think about in, you know, what an applicant uh, admissions committee is looking for on a statement of purpose is they want to know why are, why are you interested in this field, right? Why are you interested in statistics or biostatistics or data science? And then why specifically are you interested in this program at this school, right? They really want to know if we admit you that you really want to come here. So that needs to come across in your statement of purpose. And then they're generally going to be looking at writing skills as well. Right? Communication is super important to statistics, biostatistics, and data science. So this is one of the places where they're going to get a sense a little bit of your communication, particularly written communication skills. Perhaps one of the most important pieces of your application is reference letters. So typically schools are going to ask you for three reference letters. These are going to be academic reference letters. So math and stats professors that you've had, research supervisors, internship supervisors. And you want to be thinking about here people, if you can, people that know you well. right? So people that know you well as a sort of a person, a student, um, as an employee, and can really comment on your potential in this field. So finding people with sort of relevant experiences is useful. And the last piece of an application that um, does not happen at every school is an interview. So when I was applying to graduate schools, it was very uncommon for schools to have an interview. I think I've noticed a trend again of that becoming a little bit more common over time. But I think it's still true that most schools do not have an interview but some might. So just something to be aware of. Um, and I think in general, what they're looking for in an interview is sort of soft skills. So again, like, can you have a conversation with us about statistics? And do you really want to come here? Right. So they're looking again, just to get to know you a little bit um, and find out if you're a good fit for the program. So that's kind of detailed information about each of those pieces. My sort of takeaway message of, you know, if I had to tell people what is an admissions committee looking for, there's three things. One is, can you pass our classes and our exams? Right, again, they want to admit people that are going to succeed in the program. So they want to make sure that you will be able to pass their classes, their, any qualifying exams that they have. So that's something you're demonstrating, you know, with your math, your stats background, um, and sort of how you've done in your classes so far. The second piece is, can you write a dissertation or a thesis or a capstone project, depending on what type of program you're applying to? That comes in with talking about sort of your prior research experience or projects that you've worked on. And then do you actually want to come here? So that really is going to come through in your statement of purpose. But those, I think, sort of overall are the three things that you want to make sure you've sort of clearly answered in all of your application materials. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can open up 
the questions here. I just want to say quick, um, I posted these slides on my on my website. So if anybody wants to come back to them later, I think we'll also post them on the EUSR website. So feel free to come back to this or reach out to me if anyone has questions that don't get answered today. But yeah, we'll see what questions people have while we're all here. Yeah, so thank you, Professor Grindy, for giving us that overview. Um, just a, another like friendly reminder, encouragement for all our um, attendees to use the Q&A feature to send in questions. Um, we're gonna begin with just uh, like a quick introduction with the other panelists to ask um, like about their path to graduate school and also their experiences in graduate school. Um, Leticia, did you wanna begin? Uh, yes, I can begin. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Leticia and I currently work as a data scientist at Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, it's an online marketplace where teachers can upload and sell lesson plans and curriculums to other teachers. And the way that I sort of ended up where I am right now and how grad school relates to that is kind of a long story, but I'll make it short because I'm a, I would consider myself as a non-traditional student who pursued a statistics path. Um, in undergrad, I did study sociology and education, but after that, I went to work in school. So I worked at a charter school in Boston for a year, and I also spent two years working as a behavior specialist. So I worked with students who were diagnosed with different emotional and behavioral disorders, and I actually thought that I wanted to become a psychologist. So I like, was also taking psychology prerequisite courses. And by the time I finished the prerequisite courses and after two years of working at the school, I realized that I wanted to do less direct um, sorts of therapeutic or... Um, psychological work and that I was more interested in research, especially because the schools that I was working at, a lot of them were data-driven schools um, where there'd be different interventions going on uh, because they were thought to have a certain amount of impact on students' achievement or just like different policies that they implemented. So through the classes and through working in these environments, I started to become more interested in data and how to like actually use this data to inform interventions or to measure the impact of um, different policies. So I decided to go back to grad school to get a master's in applied statistics in social science research. So um, this program's at NYU and I did the program in 2015 and I was actually in the second cohort of students. So before me, there were only two students in the program. And then in my year, there were I think like 10 to 12 students. So Data science was definitely a thing when I went to grad school, but there weren't very many programs out there. So I sort of decided that I would try to find a program that had my interest. So the fact that it was a social science program, but it had my interest in a way that I could explore them quantitatively. Um, so I feel very fortunate to have been able to have identified probably around five programs. And I think that the one at NYU was the best fit for me, given my background. Um, and I primarily uh, use those skills to work in research settings. So while at NYU, I did an internship at the University of Chicago, they have a crime and education lab. So I did some research work there. After I graduated, I also spent some time working at NYU in their School of Medicine. So working uh, in a department that was interested in measuring the impact of medical education. So they didn't just want to be a school where they admitted highly qualified students. And because they admitted highly qualified students, they went on to be highly qualified doctors. They really wanted to measure the added value of medical education. So I worked in that environment for about a year and a half. Um, and from there, that's how I ended up transitioning to working at a, a tech company. So the experience is kind of interesting because I do have the education background and a lot of people who work at my company do. Um, so I think one of the ways I guess like grad school prepared me for that and things that I've had to continue to build upon after graduate school is using statistics to solve applied problems and specifically in the environment that I'm at now is using statistics to study um, like applied business types of problems. Because before a lot of the questions that I would answer were related to education interventions. And now where I'm at, it's using statistics to develop technological solutions to uh, needs in education. Uh, so that can be anywhere from how we use data to 
help our customers find our the resources that are on our site to how can we use data to develop a digital product that will be used by students and teachers. Uh, so I think that's like a short overview of where I'm at and sort of how grad school played into that, but uh, def definitely feel free to ask me more questions about this. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Olivia, do you wanna go ahead? Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so um, I went to Biola University for undergrad, which is a small liberal arts school in California. And I kind of switched my major a lot. I started, I knew I liked math and science and I didn't really know what to do with that. I'd never really heard of like being a statistician. So I started out as an engineering major, switched to chemistry. And then I just kept taking math classes because I liked them. And so I ended up double majoring in math, but I kind of was more, I mean, I hung out more in the chemistry department. All my friends were chemists and I got to do um, a summer research experience for undergrads, are you in chemistry? And I got to work in a grad program and I realized that I really liked the grad school environment. I realized it was fun to work on these sort of research projects. And I liked the environment being with people, um, other students. So I decided to apply for grad programs and applied for a mix of chemistry and math programs. Um, but I had decided that I really, or statistics programs, I didn't apply to any math ones. I just ended up realizing that I really liked statistics more than chemistry. I liked, um, applying math to real world problems, which you get to do in chemistry too. But um, so I ended up coming to the University of California, Irvine and I'm a fourth year student. Um, so that means I have a little less than two years to go. Um, and most of my research is uh, motivated by problems in Alzheimer's disease. All right, thank you, Olivia and Letitia for sharing your experiences. Um, Right now, I'd like to again encourage people, if any of our attendees have questions, to please submit them through the Q&A box. Um, we've gotten a couple good questions thus far. Um, and so I'd like to kick off sort of our, our Q&A with you guys um, with a question from Angela. And she asks, how much do you feel like graduate schools help in opening up career opportunities, particularly in industry? And how is this different um, between a bachelor's degree versus a master's versus a PhD? I don't know a ton about jobs in industry, to be honest. So I don't know, Letitia, I feel like you maybe have a little bit more experience in this than I do. Yeah, I was trying to think about um, which angle I wanted to take for answering this question since I <laughs> kind of jumped around a little bit. Uh, but specifically, I guess, grad school and opening up career opportunities. I'll say that at least in my experience, I think that my grad school experience did a nice job with opening up opportunities within um, like social research settings. So like since I did social science or the program was like titled for social science research. So those types of environments as well as um, working within like government agencies. I think that a lot of the skills that we learned was definitely applicable to that area. When it comes to experiences outside of that. One thing that I probably should have done, but I just sort of didn't realize it at the time, given my interests as a student, was that it probably would have been useful for me to have found an internship outside of um, an academic setting or outside of some sort of government research setting, just so that I could have been a little bit more informed on the differences in statistics in a, uh, a research policy sort of setting versus a, like we are a company with a bottom line and specifically like with me being at a tech company, um, a company that's actually developing something that's totally brand new that doesn't exist. Like how is data used to create new products? That's something that I didn't have much experience in. And I don't think that grad school, I mean, grad school definitely didn't hurt. <laughs> um, for me pursuing those types of opportunities. But I did have to do a little bit more research. Um, one book that I do recommend to a lot of people who are interested in using some of their grad school skills where maybe they like primarily worked in research settings first is this book called Hacking Growth. And what I like about that book is it talks about 
product development at tech companies, but not necessarily from the data analyst perspective. It talks about it from the team perspective. So there are like a lot of people who you work with, like product managers or product marketing managers or engineers. Uh, they're just like a lot of job roles that I was unfamiliar with before. So it was helpful to read that book to understand those different roles, but they also like highlight the role of an analyst. So better understanding how data analytics work fits into that process, um, I found to be very helpful. So the book is called Hacking Growth. The other thing I just thought of as you were talking was um, just sort of anecdotally hearing about, right, there can be, there are salary differences sometimes. So I had a friend who actually like was working for a company and got her master's while she was working, um, which is one of the ways sometimes that you can help get your master's degree paid for is sometimes companies will help pay for your degree. Um, and after she got her master's degree, her salary basically doubled um, doing basically the same position, right? So, so although sort of perhaps silly, I mean, like sometimes just having that, those extra letters on your resume can open up some doors to certain types of positions where they'll only consider people with a master's degree or can um, result in some salary boosts as well. That actually reminds me of one other thing I wanted to point out because I could only speak for like a bachelor's and a master's experience, not necessarily a PhD, but one thing I would say with opportunities and how that could differ from a master's to a PhD is I feel like I didn't have as much experience as I wanted when I left grad school. I only had two years of experience. I was able to work on some projects, but I didn't have the opportunity to do as much in real or like real world application type of work. So I would imagine like with a PhD, you do have more time to do that. And that could present different career opportunities versus someone who's graduating with a master's, but with not as much a career experience. So I didn't apply for any um, data science jobs right off, out of undergrad, but I have um, some friends who did. And one of my friends works as a data engineer now, and she really likes the work. And it's cool like to get to talk to her and hear what she does. And I think I could have found a lot of jobs I would have liked with just an undergrad degree. But for me, I thought I would like the process of going to grad school. So that's why I decided to do it. Since I don't necessarily want to be a professor, I don't need a PhD. Um, but I haven't really started applying for jobs yet, so I don't really know what that process is going to be like. Great, thank you. Um, so just wanted to give a quick time check. I know it feels like we just started, but um, we have around like 10 minutes left of the panel. Um, I know that we're talking a lot about industry, so I think we'll kind of go back to it at the end if we have time. But I just wanted to pose a broad question for everybody um, about um, their experiences in graduate school. Um, so what were the most challenging aspects of your graduate school experience and what advice would you give to students um, to mitigate or overcome similar challenges? Um, uh, Professor Grindy, do you wanna begin? Sure, I lost my mouse for a second to unmute. Um, so yeah, I think challenges, you know, one of the things, the first year was probably the toughest for me, I would say. Um, and I feel like part of that transition that was tough, there were a couple of different pieces that were challenging. Um, one of the things that I think was challenging was getting used to um, very different teaching styles and um, just sizes of classes. So I had gone to a very small liberal arts college that was very teaching focused. Um, then going to a big research university where, you know, I do think that the large majority of my professors in graduate school really cared about teaching, but not all of them did. It's a big research university. Some people are more research focused and those classes um, with those people did not feel, felt very overwhelming for me. It was a lot more just sort of them lecturing, um, not much like active learning involved in sort of classroom time. And that was a big transition for me coming from a, again, a small school with super active um, we were doing sort of active activities in our classes. So more independence in your learning process, which was a big transition. And then I think the other big shift for me um, was in that getting used to in the first year is that, you know, in order to pay for your school and your stipend, you're doing 20 hours a week of either research or teaching and trying to figure out that balance. You know, I had worked in college, but not usually 20 hours a week. It was more like 10. And so that transition was pretty tough for me as well, just to figure out how to balance, you know, both of these things are important to your training. But the coursework feels 
more important sometimes, but yeah, the research and teaching side of it is just important. So getting that balance right was, was tough for me in that first year. I think the hardest part for me was the qualifying exams and the classwork, um, which I finished all my classes in the first two years, but I think the classes were much like significantly harder than my undergrad math classes. And I mean, I came from a liberal arts school, so maybe that was part of it, um, but this was just much more theoretical. Plus I was, I mean, all of a sudden I was surrounded by people who loved statistics versus before there was a lot of people who didn't really like math as much who were taking my classes. So all of a sudden all your classmates are just much more skilled. Um, but I think my advice would be to really get to know your classmates because one of the great things at UCI is all the first year students share an office and we all became really good friends. And so we'd always do our homework together and we studied for the qualifying exams together. That helped me to have some sort of accountability. And when I'd get stuck, I wouldn't just you know panic. I could ask my friends. Um, and so that really helped. And for myself, I would say the hardest part probably was related to me being a career changer. Like since I had taken some years um, in between undergrad and grad school and also my interests had changed, I honestly hadn't taken a math class in an academic setting maybe in like five years before I went to grad school. So there are like a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, the one way that I was able to overcome that is like the textbook that we used for that course we started midway through the textbook. So at the beginning of the semester, I started at the beginning of the textbook and worked my way to the middle, like as quickly as I could, so I could have better context and understand what was going on. Because I don't remember what was said, but I feel like it was probably, like it felt like a foreign language, those first few classes. So uh, definitely trying to find other resources. And even now, like there are, like online courses that I'll find and just to like listen to other people's explanations of concepts. So I think trying to identify those other resources early is, um, can help with those types of challenges. Cool. Thank um, you all for, for those. Oh, Amber, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, just a quick follow-up question. Um, I think this works well with what you just said, Letitia. Um, how can non-traditional students gain research experience and statistics to strengthen like their application or like their experience in um, in a master's or PhD program? Um, I did a Coursera, no, not Coursera. I did an edX class. It was an edX class for statistics and R. So that helped quite a bit. Um, since I was living in Boston, when I was working at those schools, there are a lot of universities around there. And I somehow found this one professor who was open to having people who weren't in school help her out with research. So I would say do some Googling around and see. And also this woman, she had a non-traditional background. So I think that's why she was open to someone who wasn't a student um, helping her with some research. And I'm gonna give a quick plug for this program that I'm actually participating in right now. It's called Data Science for All Empowerment. I'll try to find a link and drop it in the channel. Uh, but it's like a 14 week data science program. and there are people like me who have experience in data science, but there are also people who are brand new to the field. So I think maybe trying to find opportunities like that where you can definitely get your feet wet. And if you want to explore further, then you can use that as a launching pad for a grad program as well. Okay, thank you, Letitia. Um, I think we have time for around one more question. Uh, time really flies, but I think a good question to sort of close out um, this discussion of grad school would be how do students gauge fit with a particular graduate program? And then maybe as a second part to that question, do you have any pieces of advice for um, students applying to graduate school programs to make their application stand out from, from the rest? I felt like when I was applying to grad school that everyone said you should pick your, research, um, your grad school based off research interests but I had no idea what I wanted to do. So, I mean, I would look on the website, look at the different um, professors and kind of, you know, for my um, personal statement, I would pick a couple of professors and say why I wanted to work with them, but I wasn't really sure if that's what I wanted to do. So I think once you get admitted, most schools will um, fly you out to go visit. Um, and that probably depends on if they have an interview or not, what order that would be. But um, that was super helpful for me because I went to go visit and you can kind of see what sort of classes there are, 
and you can kind of just feel if you'll fit in with the students. And so one of the reasons I picked UCI was that I had a lot of fun at the visit day and felt like, oh, I think I could be friends with these people, which I think is really important. Yeah, I totally agree with what Olivia just said. I think that visit day is what really helped me make my decision. So thinking about this now with, you know, not knowing what visit the visit day situation is going to look like for those of you applying to grad schools this year. Um, but I hope that, you know, there will still be some sort of virtual visit day, at least so that you can get to meet the other people right in your who would be in your incoming cohort of students and, ex, you know, current students in the program. And I feel like a combination, both of, yeah, thinking about, um, like thinking about the students who are there and do they seem happy and do they seem engaged in the department? And, you know, you can pick that up pretty quickly, um, even just talking to people, I think. So I think even if you don't get the opportunity to do a physical visit, like hopefully there will be some opportunities to talk to current students. Um, and then I think the my one piece of advice for making your application stand out, I think, you know, lots of people applying to graduate school are super highly qualified, right? have good grades in their math and stats classes, you know, experience, relevant experience. So I think one of the ways that you can really stand out is in your personal statement by really making it clear like that you want this. And, um, you know, on the one side, one hand, I think, you know, I don't want people to stress too much about the personal statement because you can you can get in with a okay personal statement, but I think that's one of the key ways that you can really distinguish yourself as in, like show your individual individuality um, and really sort of get that across because that doesn't come through in your CV or your transcript, right? So that's I think my key piece of advice. Yeah, and for myself, like I mentioned, I had a social science background, so I specifically was looking at social science master's programs. Um, I was also very much interested in, like, I guess what the industry looked like in the city that my school was in. So that was one of the reasons, like, I intentionally wanted to go to grad school in New York City because I knew that there were, like, a lot of different data science initiatives within the city. Uh, so that definitely helped to inform my decision. And even, like, my grad program, there was an opportunity to visit ahead of time. This was before I applied, but I just, like, sent a letter to the person in charge of admissions asking, like, if I could sit in on a class or if they, like, have any sorts of events. Uh, like I said, my program was new, so that's probably why it was very easy for me to sit on a, sit in on a class there, but I would definitely recommend doing that, and, yeah, you know, for your application, I guess, like, there are so many different types of data programs at this point. So really try to find one that matches specifically what you're interested in. And I think that helps to show through on your application why you wanna be a student there. All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to close the panel and move on to uh, the next section of the conference. But we'd like to end by thanking our panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and we'd like to thank the sponsors, the American Statistical Association, um, the Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics Education, and our studio. Thank you all for joining us.